Party line? We don't need no stinking party line. Hey, everybody, it's Reporters Roundtable. I'm David Cruz. Our end of the season panel includes Nancy Solomon, senior reporter at WNYC, Brent Johnson, politics reporter for NJ Advance Media, and Charles Style, columnist for NorthJersey.com. We're going to hear from them in just a bit, but let's begin with an assessment of what just happened with our guest who spends his time assessing these kinds of things. Micah Rasmussen is the director of the Rebovich Institute of New Jersey Politics at Rider University, and he joins us now. Micah, good to see you again. How are you doing? Thanks for having me, David. So I've interviewed you uh, during actual class time in the past, and it makes me curious, how often does what you do with us and others uh, end up being a part of your classroom uh, teaching? The, the the signature class that I teach is New Jersey government and politics. And basically the best advice I can give them is follow Spotlight, read what, you know, I, I, I'm never so bold as to say Google me. But, you know, we do end up discussing the news that I discuss every day. Yeah. I mean, it's usually the beginning of classes. Whatever they have read that they have questions about is how we start the day. Interesting. So, all right. Uh, our panelists are eager to engage with you, so let's get to some of their questions right now. Uh, Brent Johnson, you got one? Well, yes. Uh, hi, Micah. We, we just saw the governor sign the controversial Open uh, Public Records Act bill um, into law. How much do you think that will affect his legacy? Because all the progressives are saying, you know, you're dead to us. You went hard. Yeah, uh, I think um, you went hard on the governor this week. Yeah, I, I think he deserves all of that and more. Um, he has taken our records. Let's face it, they are public records. Uh, they belong to the public. We paid to generate them. And he's put them a little further out of our reach. And in some cases, a lot more out of our reach. And I think it's a dirty deal. Um, I think it is. It, it was pushed by mayors who don't want access. They don't want scrutiny. They don't want accountability. Um, and uh, I think he, he absolutely made the wrong call. And I think it will affect him. As somebody who was in the governor's office when the original Oprah law was signed 20 years ago, I can tell you it was one of the most proud uh, moments that I have had looking back on my time in the office. I think the opposite is going to be true of him. I think it's something he's really got to look back on and regret. Once he gets out from under that bubble and out from under that dome, he's going to see that this was a mistake. I talked to historians, genealogists, people you would never expect who use Oprah on a daily basis. And they're not going to know until they go to make the next request that they can't get metadata. They can't make multiple requests. They can be accused of harassment by their town. All this stuff was not a hassle before and now is going to be a hassle. Yeah. Uh, Charlie, you want to jump in here? Uh, on Oprah or I, I, whatever you I, want. I, you I, had a question? Oh, well, on, on, on the question about the line and Tuesday's results, I now that the county uh, the, the the county parties were able to flex their and reassert their power um, without the line, how much do you think this is going to undercut any push uh, to reform the system within the legislature? Remember, we heard the uh, uh, leadership right. of both parties vowing to do that uh, in the wake of the court decision. I don't think this is going to dissuade them at all. I think they're going to try and come up with whatever they're going to do, color coding or listing the party uh, at the top or whatever they're going to try and make happen. They're still going to try to make happen. Whether they can get the stamp of approval from Judge Karashi is going to be a different question. The other thing is that I'll be curious to look at, and we really aren't going to know this right away, is without the line, how much should people look at slogans and say, oh, that's the Monmouth County Democratic candidate, right? You know, or that's the Mercer County Dem Democratic candidate. Uh, I think voters were used to that cue and they were looking for that cue, however they could get it. So I don't expect the legislature to be dissuaded, but I also don't know what the judge is going to let them get away with. All right, Nancy, you got one? Yeah. Hi, Micah. Um, I'm curious what you make of the uh, Rob Menendez race in Hudson County. He's, of course, the son of 
Senator Bob Menendez, who's on trial uh, currently for bribery and corruption, I think, you know, we were thinking uh, that he was going to face some real challenge with his in the primary against Ravi Bala, the mayor of Hoboken, and he didn't. So what do you think happened there? He won by, a, you're right, he ended up winning by a, a very comfortable margin. Um, I think what happened was he had the political scare of his life put in him. Uh, he took nothing for granted. He ran a smart campaign. Um, he did a lot of Hispanic voter outreach, which let's face it, if there was any group of voters which um, stayed with his father, um, it was it was those votes that he was looking to turn out, which he did. Um, he also got the machine involved. Um, Brian Stack came out and turned out for him. Almost one out of four um, uh, of the early votes in the state were cast in Union City. So they did what they had to do. And Bala was able to get a decent margin out of Hoboken, not as much as you would want from your hometown. He won by, I don't know, maybe 20 points. He should have won by a lot more than that his own town, in his own town. Quite honestly, he had a lot of arrows being thrown at him in his own hometown. He did win uh, Jersey City. Um, but beyond that, he couldn't make inroads in the rest of the district where those organization types were just racking up the numbers for, uh, for Menendez. And you see Brian Stack literally being the guy behind the guy in that in those shots we were just uh, showing a moment ago. I guess the big takeaway, Micah, is the line uh, with or without the line, the organizations are, are, are still key. Yeah, don't count them out. We were we were ready to write their obituaries or wondering if they were going to miss a beat, figure out how to get up, get back up, dust themselves off after the decision that. Uh, ended the line. And quite frankly, they did. They figured out what they had to do. Really, what I think this boils down to is, if you are going to mount a credible challenge against the machine, you are going to have to be better known. You are going to have to be better financed. You're going to have to put together a rival to the machine itself. And so far, what we've seen is that Bala wasn't able to do that. Quite frankly, Carol Murphy and those who challenged um, Conaway, Herb Conaway, who had the support of the three county organizations in District 3, were not able to do that. And uh, Jerry Speziali, even though he was really well known and really well financed, he was not able to catch the Passaic County Democrats off guard. So you've got to have sort of all those elements to bigfoot the organizations. And so far, the challengers have not done that. That last race was uh, for county sheriff in, in Passaic County. Um, the, the race at the top of the ticket, uh, aside from the president, which was already known, uh, was Andy Kim. Uh, he was obviously the favorite there. No surprise that he won. But uh, what should we make of Patricia Campos Medina, a first time candidate who hung in there and got 114,000 votes uh, statewide? I mean, 30 percent in Middlesex, more than 20 percent in six counties, including 27 percent in Warren. 24 in Passaic, 19 in Hudson. That wasn't a protest vote, was it? Yeah, no, let's let's give her her due. Um, I spoke with Democrats around the state who were impressed um, when she went out to the county organizations and she made her pitch. And she that clearly resonated. And some people clearly, clearly remembered that. I also think it's possible that there were some uh, Tammy Murphy supporters. Don't get me wrong. Andy Kim wound up with over 75% of the vote. Um, yeah. He clearly has the party behind him, but that doesn't mean that individually there weren't voters who were looking for an alternative to Andy Kim. And I think she was that alternative. And of course, Campos Medina has the, the enduring photo. Uh, she's in the enduring photo of, of this whole process. She's standing there in front of a phalanx of, of, of uh, five Camden County thugs uh, keeping her out of the convention there. So that's that one I'm, I'm going to remember for a while. All right, let's talk GOP, Curtis Bashaw, um, Bashaw, sorry, uh, not your run of the mill Republican Senate candidate. Uh, is he maybe the right guy for these GOP times? I think he is the right guy to um, get outside of the Republican box or the box that Democrats always want to put Republicans in in New Jersey. Um, he is. Uh, Charlie and I have had discussions about this. He can expand on, on this. He, he describes himself as pro-choice. 
um, which is different. Um, we're going to push him on that a little bit and see what that really means. Um, he is against book bans. He very passionately spoke against that. He is openly gay. So he wants to get beyond those typical Republican labels and show New Jersey unaffiliated voters and even some Democrats that he is worth a look. And that is what you have to do, because if you can't attract independents, if you can't attract Democrats, then you can't win just with Republicans in New Jersey. There aren't enough of them. And you wind back up in this pattern where Republicans have lost over and over again for these Senate seats since 1972. All right, Michael Rasmussen, uh, Rebovist Institute at Ryder University. Good to see you, man. Thanks for uh, taking some time with us. Thank you. All right, panel, Nancy, Charles, uh, Brent, uh, good to see you all as well. Uh, let's start with takeaways. Charles, no line, no problem, right? Right. I, I think Micah really summed it up nicely. I mean, um, no one really, and I, 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 I sense this for a while. I mean, I'm, I don't have the same sort of on the ground uh, uh, past uh, that Micah has, but they no one doubted the ability of the party barons to adapt to this situation. They still had tremendous resources and advantages going into this race, and, um, and, and including money, name recognition. They have jobs to dispense, um, an apparatus, and the slogan. And all of that is a, still a big mountain for um, progressives to uh, climb. Andy yeah. Kim, in his uh, election night speech, kind of touched on this. He said, basically, this is a start of a long term movement. This isn't, you know, we didn't break through and and save the day on everything in this one court battle. This is the beginning, not a, a start of a movement, not the end. Nancy, you asked Mike about the Menendez uh, Bala race. Uh, we saw Senator Stack rallying the troops this week and the governor came down uh, to North Hudson. Do you agree the party still rules, yeah? Certainly in Hudson County. Uh, I think that could have been predicted to be one of the hardest places to fight the machine electorally. Um, you know, I mean, Brian Stack is just remarkable what he's able to do and what he the, the uh, support that he's built and getting out the vote. I think what we're going to see in the governor's race in 2025 and what we'll see in legislative races and in future congressional races is much stronger, better positioned candidates who will be willing to take a chance because there is that extra help of not having the line. Brent, what stuck with you or is, is the real takeaway 2025 to, to really kind of see what happened here? Yeah, I think especially after Tammy Murphy dropped out of the race and then the judge made his decision, this this Senate race is going to be interesting to watch, especially if Menendez runs as an independent yeah. uh, and Bashar really does mount the campaign. But next year is the, the whole I mean, it, it's a the governor's race is shaping up to be something like we haven't seen in a long time. You have some of the biggest names in state politics running against each other and without pros or probably without the line, if all goes as we expect it to. So that's really the race to watch where everything will be yeah. thrown open. We, we can really see the effect of this. Meanwhile, the supposed uh, Trump obsessed Republicans have put up a gay pro choice so so on Trump, South Jersey hotelier and developer. Nancy, meet the new GOP. Yeah, I mean, I think Curtis Bashaw has a lot better of a chance at coming at Andy Kim than Christine uh, Serrano Glasner would have had as the, you know, endorsed by Trump. MAGA candidate. Yeah. So Bashaw can now make the pivot to the general and uh, stop talking about endorsing Trump and start talking about the things that independents care about and might vote for him for. Uh, but and if he were up against any number of other candidates, I'd say, wow, we're going to have a real actual race for the Senate in New Jersey. Uh, but Andy Kim, you cannot underestimate that man. I mean, he, he didn't he didn't just win the primary and now, you know, is well positioned to run for the to be the nominee for the election in the Senate. He took down the Democratic Party establishment and, you know, took it on and won. And um, and I saw just so many times during the campaign between him and Tammy Murphy when we were all covering it so closely 
I just saw him have incredible political instincts time and time again. And I think that's what we're going to see. We're going to see him go at Bashaw uh, and make it very difficult for a, a candidate who endorsed a convicted felon. <laughs> you know, and that's what he's going to say. He said it on election night. Um, and he's going to say it over and over and over again. This is a man who endorsed Donald Trump after he had been convicted on 34 counts of, of felony. Yeah. Charlie, is uh, Curtis Bashaw the kind of Republican that a New Jersey unaffiliated voter could love? I, I think I think uh, he's sort of back to the future Republican. And, you know, he is right kind of from he's from the center the establishment small business um try it's sort of lowercase i in in terms of ideology um the only difference he's openly gay which is a uh, you know a new thing for the republican party here a new di uh, uh, dimension i don't think it's going to matter that much at all in the general election um and i uh i, I think um, I think Nancy's right, though. I, I, I saw Andy Kim come out with his, you know, you know, here he is, wonky Andy Kim, aspirational Andy Kim, friendly Andy Kim, took off the gloves in that barn in Lawrenceville on election night and and said, you know, basically he's a, he's on the side of a convicted felon. And, th and that's who he's going to stand for. And it, it, that's going to he also said he's. That's who he's that defines him in his short career in politics. And I intend to keep it a short career in politics. I mean, he was like Jake LaMotta all of a sudden. So I, I think Nancy's 100 percent right. He's got a lot of he's a crafty political fighter and not one to be us underestimated. All you have to do is ask Chris Russell, yeah. who dueled with him in his uh, two or three races for Congress down there in South Jersey. He'll tell you the same thing. Yep. All right, uh, Brent, Senator Menendez, you mentioned, filed to run as an independent uh, in the fall. What could go wrong for Democrats in the fall with that? Well, I'm sure a lot of Democrats aren't happy about this, although we still really don't know how this is going to shake out. Um, we don't know if he'll be convicted, if if he is convicted, if he's going to stay in the race like Donald Trump is going to stay in his race. Um, so the, a lot of things could happen. He has until August 16th to pull out, so his name could still be on the ballot if he hasn't. Um, but it's definitely not a great thing for Democrats. You know, you can't say it's a good thing because his name will be on there. And I'm sure there is a small pocket of support who will still support him. The question is whether it will be enough to really sway the race and, and give, it, give it a better chance for Republicans to win. There's a lot to be seen here, but it's, it's certainly a, an interesting development. Yeah. Uh, you know, the other news this week, not directly uh, political uh, related, uh, congestion pricing. Uh, New York Governor Kathy Hochul killed it this week. Uh, what was that about, Nancy? Politics or economics? Politics. <laughs> politics, 100 yeah. um, percent. And I don't think it's so much the politics of them being concerned about Josh Gottheimer and, and Phil Murphy. I think uh, Kathy Hochul was listening to uh, Democrats in her state who were saying, do not do this thing before the November election. Are you crazy? Uh, so I, I think this was very political. And I think indefinitely means, you know, November. Ah, interesting. All right. Home stretch on the state budget now. Uh, shut down or no shut down, Charles? I doubt there'll be a shutdown. I, I, I don't know this, but I, it just seems to me that the, I don't know this for a fact, but, but the governor signing the Oprah bill the other day to me signaled that uh, a lot of the ducks are already in a row here with uh, any kind of uh, deals with the legislature. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, I mean, if that was, if there were things that were unresolved, he would have used that bill as leverage because he had some time on his hands. I think the 45 day window would have expired right around July 1st. So no, I don't expect a big budget drama. Yeah. Because the, the fix was in way early, wasn't it, Brent? Well, I, I heard that, yeah, this was part of a, the Oprah bill was signed in a deal that happened a long time ago, a few yeah. months ago. But I have heard whispers about taxes 
And, you know, we even heard it in budget hearings that there's been talk of, well, maybe let's raise the sales tax if we're going to have a budget crunch. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't think we're completely out. I don't see a shutdown in the presidential election year. But, you know, I still think there's something here that hasn't been worked out. And I think sales tax is the two words you should be thinking about. All right. So maybe some drama still ahead. All right. In lieu of our only in Jersey, I thought we'd um, just look at maybe the jerseyest thing uh, that you covered this season. Nancy, let's start with you. I'm going to have to go with the Bob Menendez corruption case. I mean, yeah. it just has so many features that are so New Jersey. In fact, I think I wrote a piece back in the fall that was like the five things that make this so New Jersey. Huh. And uh, I think really, I mean, the stacks of cash, the cash in his jacket with his name embroidered um, on it, uh, the gold bars, which is kind of like, New Jersey politics meets the reality show Jersey Shore. Uh, you know, the, the steakhouse <laughs> dinner with the Egyptian intelligence officials, which, you know, I mean, it's not a Jersey diner, but there are so many great expensive steak dinner backroom deal stories that we've had over the years. Um, and uh, and then throwing his wife under the bus. I mean, I, I couldn't love this story more, to be honest. I mean, it's just unbelievable the gift it keeps giving on this one what else can the love of my life do for you uh brent what do you, brent what do you got well to go back to what we were talking about earlier and, and a thing that happened because of the menendez thing is is the the crazy fight between tammy murphy and andy kim in this primary we were going to things reporters were going to uh <laughs> conventions that we never would have gone to before because the governor's wife um and the first lady were, were running was running for the nomination against an insurgent, um, you know, congressman. And she ended up dropping out right before this massive decision that changed the face of New Jersey politics. And I don't know if anyone in Iowa or Arkansas could fully understand how machine politics like dominated this story and our lives for, for like eight weeks. It was, it was insane. Yeah. I, I've never covered so many County conventions. Uh, Charlie, yeah. what do you got? I, I, I want to say, just to add on to that, that's exactly, I mean, the county conventions, uh, I, I don't think I've, you know, covering, I've covered that before in, in such detail with such drama. You know, I've covered the Iowa caucuses when Christie was running for president in right. uh, 2016. So that was, that was, you know, quaint. This was real stuff. I felt, I also had this throwback feel like I was, you know, like this was the 1930s again, and uh, and, and there were brass spittoons in the corner. I mean, it just there was something really old school about it, and on the ground, colorful. And I think the one signature moment was in Monmouth County when the results came in, and I think it was Tracy from the New York Times said to me, "Look at Frank Pallone's face over there. It looked like he just seen a you know a, a nightmare on Elm Street." And 20 seconds later, the results come in and his candidate, Tammy Murphy, lost by a big margin. And it was really just seeing it in real time, which is really dramatic, colorful, and probably we won't see that for a long time to come. Yeah. All of those are, are definitely uh, very Jersey. Uh, I would have picked any of those. Uh, mine is from Hudson County, where I covered the series of public meetings and uh, related events uh, related to the redevelopment of Liberty State Park. Uh, it's so Jersey that an out-of-town billionaire golf course owner would lay down millions of dollars to essentially buy off elected officials in an effort to convince local residents that the State Department of Environmental Protection has a plan to flood the park and, by extension, the surrounding community of longtime poor and working-class residents. The lie is one thing because um, that's not the plan at all. But those elected officials who perpetuate the lie deserve a Bronx cheer or more appropriately, the Jersey state bird, which uh, nests nearby in the bird sanctuary that the billionaire wants to pave over. And that's going to do it for Roundtable <laughs> this season. Charles, Nancy, Brent, a pleasure to work with you all season long. Thank you so much. Thanks also to Mike Rasmussen. Uh, for joining us. And thanks to all of you for your support this season. We really do appreciate it. Follow us on X at Roundtable NJ and at David Cruz NJ all summer long. 
For all the crew here at Gateway Center in downtown Newark, I'm David Cruz. Thanks for watching. Have a great summer. Major funding for Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz is provided by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Business Magazine, the magazine of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, reporting to executive and legislative leaders in all 21 counties of the Garden State since 1954. And by Politico's New Jersey Playbook, a topical newsletter on Garden State politics, online at politico.com.